uh, good evening one and all on behalf of vivekananda institute of indian studies a unit of the swami vivekananda youth movement i am bhargavi welcoming you all to the understanding india webinar series today is the second session of the series and the topic for today is indian heritage archaeology and conservation a case study in old goa may i request all the participants to mute their microphones for the present we will have a question and answer session in the end and those who want to ask questions can unmute themselves or also can drop the questions in the chat box i would like to start with a brief introduction to our organization swami vivekananda youth movement svym is a development organization started in the year 1984 and engaged in building a new civil society in india through its grassroots to policy level action in the health education and community development sectors svym runs seven institutions and 40 plus pro uh, projects in the sectors i just mentioned having its presence across all districts of karnataka we at vivekananda institute of indian studies have been conducting programs to promote and facilitate the development and dissemination of indian culture spirituality arts music and the like we are also offering various customized courses in the context of india and internships to both international as well as indian students i now take the opportunity to introduce the speaker of the webinar today Dr Tahir Dr Nizamuddin Tahir is the former director World Heritage and Monuments of the Archaeological Survey of India and alumnus of Osmania and Nagpur universities he is the recipient of numerous fellowships his initiatives in setting up interpretation centers for educating the local communities and visitors got him another fellowship in 2010 to work in the victoria and albert museum and visit other museums he has traveled extensively in england ireland scotland and wales visiting sites and museums and giving lectures and talks he has been conferred the honorary doctorate by the cocus international university tbilisi georgia for discovering the relics of martyred queen ketevan He has worked extensively as a site manager and conservator in the regions of Goa, Hyderabad and Madhya Pradesh to preserve and conserve the protected monuments which include the UNESCO World Heritage sites at Bimbetka, Sanchi and Khajuraho. He has the experience in working at the Laure Museum France for the characterization of metal objects excavated in Dholavira a harappan site presently he is the advisor for heritage ma management and tourism related projects in goa and kerala with this introduction i extend a warm welcome to dr tahir and uh, over to you sir uh, thank you bhargavi uh, namaskar uh, participants and i'm a little uncomfortable when i'm called doctor because generally is doctor of medicine is what we consider as doctor i am an honorary doctor but still i feel very happy to have been invited uh, by uh, by the vivekananda institute and it's an opportunity for me to address colleagues friends students faculties who are pan india and i have also seen the list some of them are also from tunisia one participant i have just uh, saw his uh, reference so it feels that we are a international gathering trying to know what happened in india at some point of time now talking of heritage the very mentioning of heritage is very general and when we talk of indian heritage we get more focused now when i was listening to other lectures i was talking to my colleagues i was asking them what exactly is heritage they said you have been in this field for last 30 years and you are asking me what is heritage many times we take it 
for granted that we know what is heritage and especially what is Indian heritage. Many times we are living heritage, we are contemporary heritage, but we don't register. Whatever we get or whatever we are today, we are a product of the past. Anything, even we belong to our parents, they belong to their parents. It's a genetic connect from the past till the present. The same thing applies for the built heritage. Any built heritage that what we get or what is classified by our archaeological survey of India or state government is uh, inherited of past is also very uh, the Stone Age cultures. So all this is a collective representation of our past through a historical period, through a historical time. So we are tracing our legacy from one lakh and beyond years till the contemporary present. So what all happened within this geological strata in a geographical identity, which I personally am very comfortable calling it as Bharat, because India denotes a certain political connotation. So I would like to go beyond, I would want to go into the cultural realm where we have a common ancestor, where we have a common development of mind and the representation what we have left behind in as an archaeological relic. So that is what I generally explain as culture. But when you go for a definition, you take up any dictionary, any Google, you can get a definition. But what we feel, what we understand, like I'm speaking English, I can also speak in Hindi. Whereas many other people speak different language that is there in, the, in their respective state. So all this is cultural uh, representation of a language. It could be through music. It could be through dance. So culture has got two aspects. One, what is tangible, what we can see and feel, and what is intangible, what we think, what we smell, what we relate. So a combination of what we can feel tangible, what we cannot see, but we can feel that's intangible represents a heritage. Now, Indian heritage means whatever happened in Indian subcontinent, the Bharat, I consider that as a heritage. <laughs> so when we are talking of Indian heritage, we have got a lot of diverse representation. But there's something that is common among all of us. Many people have migrated to the country, uh, to this uh, geographical region. Many people have evolved in this region. And each one of us have got a certain distinct identity, which is linked throughout this country, throughout this geographical region, which we have inherited from our ancestors. So now, after working in the government for 30 years and protecting the built heritage and intangible sites, we think that this is what is our heritage. No, my expression could be very much limited because this is my exposure. There are many people who may not speak my language, but who may understand heritage very differently. But what is the bottom line is that what we have inherited what is not ours, what we have not uh, personally created is heritage, but over a period of time, this also becomes heritage when we pass on to the next generation. So that is the total link of understanding of a heritage, which I understand. Now, the second aspect is archaeology. Now, what is archaeology? Archaeology is a technical uh, uh, expression which stands of the material remains. A human being, when he first came on this part of the earth, in the earth subcontinent, he manufactured, he produced certain artifacts for his safety. So for safeguarding his livelihood and for carrying out this progeny uh, for the next generation, he left behind certain remains, which we say is excavated and which we try to interpret and try to understand 
through a technique which is a stratified layer one above the other so the oldest layer is below and on top of it is the layer in which we have a much more recent archaeological remains till the contemporary present so heritage archaeology and now conservation so conservation is the process of safeguarding preserving all this inherited heritage for the present so that it could be communicated for the or transmitted for the future generation so these are the broad parameters of which we understand and recently when i was hearing a talk of the first uh, webinar of dr swaminathan he has given a very good description of indian heritage i would like our participants who are here to view the uh, view, uh, i think youtube that is there on the uh, channel for having a broader understanding of this expression of heritage so with this brief description i would like to come to goa because many of the us archaeologists have worked in different spheres and i usually present the work what i have personally carried out because there are many people who are working in the field of heritage in the field of culture in the field of archaeology who are carrying out the respective work in in a different region so i was fortunate enough to work in the goa region where i could come across a stratified layer from the historical period that is the mauryan period and even earlier to it there is a reference of goa in the mahabharata and the legends also the puranas also carry reference to this area uh, as a area which was claimed because of parashurama when he builded his uh, uh, axe and reclaimed the land so but however i will be starting my presentation through a powerpoint i will try to express what i exactly we excavated at the site and when we are talking of excavation there are different cultural expressions in the country we have got the brahmanical uh, culture we have got the islamic culture we have got the uh, uh, christian culture so all this is represented in goa and we will see tangibly what we got in old goa how we have excavated what is the significance of that uh, of that excavation how we had to go about working for nearly 26 years or 24 years to be more exact to come to a conclusion and for which india got lot of acceptance in the international uh, uh, field for its archaeological work and the nations two nations we have been brought together because of through archaeology and the next step what is going to happen in near future is our prime minister is going to visit and he would be honored for the work what an archaeologist has done so i would take up to this sharing of screen and going directly to my ppt so our topic is understanding india indian heritage archaeology and conservation a case study and we say jo beet gaya wo guzar nahi jata what has bygone is not forgotten or should not be forgotten and it is a 16 years of search 10 years of research to solve a historical riddle which happened in goa goa as we all know is located on the western coast of india it's a sea facing country on arabian sea and everyone in india and even in europe know about goa and this is the aerial view of its geographical location and our story, which we are going to talk about is old goa where we have got the cultural expression and historically to a archaeologically to a time which dates from the 3rd century onwards that is when the history of india is supposed to have been recorded so in goa at different sites there is a place where it's excavated a place called chandur interior goa where we have got uh, found the remains of the mauryan period so the history apart from the reference in mahabharata and puranas historically the uh, and archaeologically goa as evident is from the 3rd century bc onwards 
then we come to a time when the shatamanas ruled this area shatamanas of kolapur which was subsequently taken over in the 4th century by the bojas in which they had the capital at chandrapur that's chandor on the bank of a river sal followed by the chalukyas of badami which is quite evident from the slide that i'm showing you but you see at different period of time different dynasties ruled and all of these dynasties have left left behind some cultural residue which are tangible which are in form of an archaeological uh, relics also temples especially from the 3rd cent 13th century onwards we have got a very good uh, representation of the yadava uh, period in form of a temple at tamdesurla that is the 13th century then we continue again during the time of the uh, delhi sultanates who overran the area and subsequently it was uh, under vijayanagara followed by the sultans of uh, gulbarga and then the bijapur and then coming of the indo europeans the portuguese and finally the liberation and being integrated into the mainstream indian uh, uh, political unit so when you talk of goa we only think of goa as a tourist paradise or talk of the beach culture but many a time even when we go there we never think that in goa we had this historical elements existing in that small piece of land which is generally considered as a place where fun and frolic is supposed to have happened but whenever i tell people that i have worked in goa and i have worked there for 10 years and we have come across the region which is very rich in our indian heritage so this is a laterite cave a rock cut cave a brahmanical cave at a place uh, near uh, old goa called aravalan it's a brahmanical uh, shivling which is there in these caves which many people don't know because the monument is not very prominent and it's not on the tourist list but you see the cultural layers that what we have have tangibly you could visit feel it for yourself and then imagine goa is a multicultural site in which we have got historical elements from the remote times till the contemporary present and the present day people need to be exposed to the cultural elements of goa which is as a representation of the mainstream india and here we have got a temple setting which is called again a mahadev temple these temples have been transplanted at from a place called salavalam a dam was being constructed uh, around uh, 40 years back and subsequently this small monument had to be transplanted 8 kilometers away from its original site and now it is located at a place called kurdi and this is a laterite and laterite is a raw material which is used for constructing the temples the mosque and the church because this are a remnants of a iron content in which the silica has been dished away and the brick that is left behind is used for construction and it's very easy, easily available in goa and here we see a mahadev temple at kurdi which has been transplanted 8 kilometers away from its site and it's a very unique work done by my senior colleagues and we could only maintain the site and we want the people to understand that this is also a relic of the past which needs to be preserved for the present by the present for the future here is an example of as i mentioned earlier of the yadava period in which we have a temple again it's a mahadev temple of 13th century you see its architectural style you see it represents very close to the hoysala style and the material that is used is schist and this material is not locally available as i just mentioned that we have got mostly uh, laterite uh, raw material then how did this material come from and where did this material come from so in all probability this material came from across the western ghats where the we have got quarries of the laterite schist so during the historical period also there was lot of movements of raw material 
movements of ideas movement of architecture movement of human labor movement of skills and all that what is left behind through their expertise is this heritage which archaeology survey of india is preserving so the heritage what we have got it has to be preserved it has to be conserved and then transmitted to the next generation now we have seen the temples we have seen the pramanika caves now goa also has got the representation as we have seen in the flow chart of the bahmani period in the bahmani period uh, ismail adil shah had constructed this mosque and this is called the safa masjid and this is located at fonda in fonda we have got other uh, temple remains which is very popular the mangeshi temple which is coexisting with uh, a mosque so in goa we have got cultural elements of all the cultural representation of the country and then comes the representation of the uh, uh, portuguese period in form of a fort which is at aguada this is after this uh, after setting up of old goa by the portuguese establishing their uh, political hegemony uh, after defeating the uh, uh, bahmanis through adil shahis we have got this remain on a fort which represents a completely a uh, portuguese type of a uh, fortification which overlooks the sea which safeguards the mouth of the river which is mandovi and mandovi at some point of time was also known as uh, gotan uh, gomti and in goa we have got two major rivers the uh, mandovi and the zuwari in which we have got this network of waterways on the bank of which small villages developed into towns and town developed into cities during the historical period and here we come to old goa which i am going to talk about in my uh, communication that this old goa who had the remains of vijayanagara this old goa has the remains of uh, bahmanis adil shahis and the superficial layer on top is that of the portuguese and the contemporary present so we always use the word portuguese the the cultural remains that what we have in Go old goa is not the portuguese but of the europeans so it, we call it indo europeans so any cultural relic be it a monument be a heritage site that is what is existing in india is the indian heritage and it is always indo european that is represented in old goa and i we are going to talk about this area which is now under a world heritage of which seven monuments have been identified under the unesco category so this is the brief flow chart of the europeans coming and settling down but why are we presenting only european because we have not yet excavated in detail the early strata now i am since i have worked in goa for last 10 years we could excavate the present strata so we in old goa have got another hampi we have got a strata when we excavate we have got the remains of the previous adil shahis before that of the vijayanagara before that of the kadambas before that of the saliharas and shatamanas so whenever we can get an opportunity to excavate because now what is happening in india many of the places which are archaeological site are being inhabited by the present day habitation because of the rising population we are not able to get to the lower strata luckily the state government the central government are protecting the areas which are being excavated and we are talking about history because once we have the history historical record but the historical record have to be matched by the archaeological uh, remains so that we can correlate the two and say this is how it was existing in that point of time and the historical facts has to be verified and we could do or me and my team could verify the uh, the strata of the 16th century which are the remains of the indo europeans so here we have got a representation which talks about 1510 onwards in which we have got the remains of a city which can be compared or marvel with any of that in the europe and our city in old goa at some point of time could be compared to lisbon and rome and this has been uh, documented by the travelers who had come to uh, old goa that's marco polo and other uh, people who recorded 
the activities taking place in old goa this because basically which was a trade city which developed and prospered now you see the layout the if you can see the layout of old goa which is very similar to that in lisbon but what is remaining now has been documented so documentation is very important in archaeology because when we have a remain it has to be documented maybe through drawings because at that point of time there was no photography and this lopez sketches of lopez mendes in 1886 leave behind a very good record of what the city was existing but now if you go to old goa you have mostly which is in ruins but we have still have got the stately monuments that are the seven uh, monument that are under the world heritage and also other uh, monuments which are still existing which needs to be preserved our story of old goa is communicated through the excavation that what we we had carried out in st augustine complex now st augustine complex even historically if you go back through the sketches we can see how it was there located on the outskirts of old goa within the perimeters of the seven hills which could be compared with rome and now this is a shot of 1990s of a tower which looks like a part of a church and which had collapsed any monument which is not maintained not conserved tend to decay so did this augustine complex in old goa this was a massive church one of the biggest church in old goa which belonging to the augustinian order but since it was not properly maintained and in 19 in 1834 35 the portuguese themselves had uh, uh, commissioned the demolishing of this church because by then the church had come under the political suzerainty and the state wanted to uh, wanted the orders or the different uh, setting establishment of the church to vacate this old goa and they were, had confiscated their property so when it was not properly maintained the church started collapsing and then we had uh, 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 taken up excavations from 1988 onwards till 2009 different teams of asi five different teams of asi worked in this area because this whole area was completely had gone into the ruins but we have a very fascinating story of this area because the first work was taken up in 1988 by my predecessors which we call the phase 1 you can see the ruins complete ruins and when you talk of ruins archaeological site basically are in ruins but it is for us archaeologists to make it speak make and conserve it and talk about the social life that must have been existing in that area so uh, the debris removal has taken place and after you remove the debris you have to conserve the site because the site what we said heritage it has to be preserved so this is also indian heritage many times we people mistake it and they say this doesn't belong to india any uh, structure any activity any remnants of a cultural uh existing in india is an indian heritage it may be influenced by certain external element but since it's in india we call it an indian heritage that's my definition maybe there'll be always a difference of opinion so we have we have got a remains of a queen which we have been hearing now we are leaving the shores of goa and going to a, to georgia georgia is a place which is between turkey and persia where we have a geographical entity which at some point of time was a small buffer state between these two ottoman turks and the safavid persia and we also had the russian romanov in the north so in one of the expeditions the shah abbas king of iran captured the queen ketawan and brought her and kept her imprisoned in iran from georgia so how is it related how is georgia related to iran how is iran related to goa 
since shahbaz 1 and talking of 16 14 captured this queen and brought her and kept her imprisoned in shiraz in iran and ultimately she was put to death in 1624 and before being put to death there were two uh, uh, fathers friars from the augustinian order who had come from portugal to asfahan shiraz to befriend the queen and when this she was put to death she was buried within the convent and when and when she was buried within the convent and later when they left this area place the uh, the one of the father took the remains of the queen back to georgia and one of the some of the remains that is the hand portion or the arm portion was brought to india that is goa and kept in the augustinian uh, church now we have got from goa we have left the shows we are talking of georgia we are talking of portugal we are talking of iran and then we are connecting with goa so what is the connection the connection is that the queen because she had resisted the advances of shahbaz of persia she was canonized as a saint and the georgia after becoming independent from russia they were wanting the remains of the queen from the historical record which mentions that the remains of the queen was brought to goa and the remaining remains of the queen the bones were in shiraz were lost so the georgian government requested government of india that's how we are getting into government of india in 1988 and subsequently in 98 for the remains of the queen because for 400 years the remains of the queen were not traceable and only known source they came to uh, on record that was in to be in india and that to in augustin complex and previous team that is 1988 when they started the working work in syria they excavated the site and they were trying to locate the bones but the remains of the bones were not found and subsequently different teams worked in different areas they worked in the main church they worked in the uh, first uh, cluster and subsequently when my team took over in 2003 we were confronted with the uh, uh, opinion of the local people that kindly trace the remains of the russian queen as they called it but actually it's not russia it is the georgian queen so that the remains of the queen could be excavated and it could be given back to georgia since their government had requested it so our team took up the work in this area called the chapter chapel to try to locate or to clear the area for the more visitors to come to this area and also to study the ground plan we were not interested in searching for the remains of the queen because previous team four teams had worked and they could not locate it so now we are coming in from the heritage to archaeology so in 2004 when our team took up the work we were trying to excavate actually it is not excavation it is basically a scientific clearance so that is this area where we were excavating when we were clearing this area with our workers we came across the remains of manuel de sequeira on the uh, uh, on the entrance of a opening so we had no ideas that what we were looking for but when we came across this tombstone on the floor plan along with us my team we had people from uh, a local uh, from a uh, exchange student from portugal who knew portuguese and who could read latin so he said when he came across this uh, evidence from the floor this happened in 2004 he says he has read about this reference in one of his uh, document when you were studying for his master's course so we were surprised how come when we are excavating the site and this has freshly come out how could this individual know about this uh, evidence so you see in historical records we have got some reference and archaeologically when we are excavating that evidence has come in front of us we were doing archaeology and we did not know about the historical record that was there published so he or we or we came across a bone and this bone 
we were not very sure that whether this bone belongs to the queen because we had no information except that the reference of the book of the silvery go which had made a publication in 1958 in portuguese and in that in the 12th volume he had given reference of all the windows that are there in this chapter chapel which talks about the remains of the queen and the bone that was brought to goa with and this was cross referred referred by another publication of gulbenkian in published in 1985 which gave us complete history of this remains of the queen of georgia being brought to iran at persia she she being put to death and then the bones being brought to goa so now you see it is so romantic it is so fascinating we were not searching for the remains we were searching for the uh, clearing the site uh, and wanting to preserve the site wanting to conserve the site and then we come across all this uh, remains and this is the document of that uh, silver ego which mentions about everything that is there which was not known which was known historically but because of the this church went into disuse and because in 1935 the uh, the uh, the the main church collapsed and the people were using the raw material to build a new capital in panjim so all the stories fell into place just like a jigsaw puzzle on the left hand side we have got the rubik's cube we are just giving symbolically a jigsaw puzzle one second third everything falling into place whereas we as an archaeologist were not wanting or uh, wanting to search or we search for the remains of the queen so all this happened because one of my colleague and even the resource persons who knew about the story who knew about what was happened earlier they were very much interested in wanting me as an archaeologist to find it and me as an archaeologist was systematically documenting recording what we were getting and subsequently when we put all this thing together we the clues directly pointed out to the evidence of the relics of the queen ketamor of georgia now this is what the uh, uh, the seven windows and the floor plan that is referred in this document which was got by this research person and gave it to us and we excavated the site and matched all this at site at the site and this is what our team could locate the remains of the artifact that were found there and certain things what we found is the black box which which was which was kept referring in the documents of silverico and we were thinking that black box could be some uh, chamber we never ex expected that it will be a black box or which is a, a tombstone sitting on the window of the chapel because because of the collapse of the church overhead the full area had crumbled and the remains were scattered and these are the remains that what we found at the site and this uh, uh, tile what we have got at the site is still very uh, we have could not decipher it proper, uh, properly whether this also refers to queen ketaman we have got two reference which says look here lord look at you mira means could be a queen but we have not taken this as our evidence to identify the remains of the queen but basically we have worked on the remains of the queen ketaman of the silvery go which mentions of all the tombstones and of the bones that was being brought to uh, goa so this is the schematic view of the area after excavation and the second window is where the remains of queen ketaman was there on the right hand side and this is where on where we got the bones so our team was very excited especially my colleague he said we have found the bones and that could be of the queen but how could we say that it belongs to the queen we have got the bones historically we have got the place where we, the bones could have been kept in archaeologically we have found the place where the where the site uh, the bones were buried but how can we say this bone belongs to the queen so unless there is a clue that unless we do a scientific or dna analysis of this bone only then can we say that this bone belongs to the queen so there is the bone what we could uh, got into 2004 we contacted this lab in hyderabad it is the center for cellular and molecular biology and we wanted the dna analysis being done it's only when you do dna analysis of the site that we could match with a matching sample 
we okay we could do it we uh, we could uh, 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 isolate the ancient dna we could amplify it we could sequence it but after this if doing all that if you don't match it with the remains of the queen if there is any we will not be able to say that it belongs to the queen fortunately we came across uh, father georgi who is the dean of the church in georgia he says he has a very small specimen of the remains and he would give us for it to be cross examined with the specimen what we found and what we found we matched it and the matching what we got is the closest to 20% but even if we have one person matching with the remains of the queen that is enough to say that this remains belong to the queen the bone uh, belongs to the queen and this we published it in in our uh, international journal so all this work it took us seven years of laboratory work because in india as yet we have not extracted ancient dna or matched it with the remains of the queen so this is was done by the team of uh, geneticists who are located in hyderabad uh, who with whom we our team worked and we could cross match and say for ourselves that belongs to the queen of georgia and after excavating we the, the, the georgian teams came to india they were very happy and they wanted us to acknowledge and say that the remains belongs to the queen and give the remains of the queen to georgia but now as an archaeologist i could only work at one level and later it is for my institution archaeological survey of india and it is for our government of india to take this step forward and then talk of exchanging of the relic because we have got two uh, specimens of bone both of which belong to queen ketavan so now it's a political decision after uh, we have done our work so it has taken us uh, 14 years uh, i should say 24 years to identify this thing and 10 years of research and this is what is uh, published in the paper about the work what we have done and the georgian teams were very happy and they wanted to uh, honor us by giving us a doctorate they also wanted us to take the citizenship of their country but these are all uh, their goodwill but we could not accept it beyond a point except accept the doctorate and however we have to scientifically prove it that our finding is authentic that is why we waited for a couple of years till our paper was accepted internationally and this is what we in 2014 we could go to georgia make a presentation in their academic gathering and get our work acknowledged and accepted in the international parameter so after excavation we have to save the remains so when you excavate a site the site gets destroyed because and the only way to record it is either to take a photograph to make a documentary film or to recreate it the same in a museum on a, in a, a, a different setting so this is what we could do we could recreate it and make a diorama of the queen of how and where we excavated and display the bone what was there in the museum but how would the bone what we are displaying here is not the actual bone because we cannot display the actual bone it is kept in a safe custody it is the specimen of the bone that what we have made in the plaster cast is what has been displayed here and subsequently when we went to georgia in 2017 so we could see the people that we could see how elated they were and how happy they were for and the relationship that what we could develop individually was extended to the country and they have, they have acknowledged that india as a country as a archaeology as a science worked to a level of excellence and we could find the remains of the queen who by now has been identified as a saint so th- now we get into international relationship and very soon our prime minister would would be invited and they would honor our prime minister by uh, requesting them that a specimen of the bone be given to them and one specimen could be kept in india and this is subsequent development which could take place later in time so what we are wanting to show is that indian heritage which is there was found in goa is a, of a international origin and that is a remain of a queen but still it is found in india and the remain the antiquity is from india so it has become an artifact which has to follow a certain protocol and which cannot be straight away given but this could be loaned 
and when we went to georgia when we could see the emotion of the people because when you have a saint whose remains have been lost for nearly 400 years and when they could see it for themselves because the georgian country is very religious and these are not roman catholics but they belong to the orthodox orthodox order the reverence what they had the feel what they had especially among the older generation we cannot communicate it has to be felt when you go there and subsequently we wrote a paper i think if those who are interested we could uh, pass on the paper on or uh, on uh, how the events unfolded and these are the remains that is depicted in uh, the tile work of the martyrdom of the queen of a place called mukhrani in a place where the queen ketaman was born and this is what we could say that it through our research that it is a additional information it's reinterpretation of known facts and subordination of the data so this could, could uh, take took place for nearly after 10 years of our work we could conclusively say that it belongs to queen ketaman of georgia now talking of heritage talking of archaeology if we do not preserve it if we do not conserve the site then the site which is open to the vagaries of nature because we have got high rainfall in this region this will be completely destroyed so we have to conserve what we have excavated here we have adopted a methodology which is very different from what generally is adopted generally what happened uh, the previous team when they were excavating the site they completely cleared the area and removed all the debris for us even debris is an archaeological relic so once you remove a debris you cannot put it back so we argued our team argued with the conservators that even the debris should be preserved so this is a very unique type of conservation which i think so i will not say this is the only conservation methodology that is there even in europe or even elsewhere in the country there may be some remains but we have not come across uh, evidence place where we could all where we have where people have also conserved the debris so now we have what we have done you can see on the left hand side is there was a wall so the wall has fallen down so the fallen down wall is also been conserved at the site on the right hand corner we have the remains of a, a roof the bricks are evident it has fallen down even that has been preserved at the site so when you go to a site you feel that you're walking in the ruins so this is what we wanted to project and this is very well uh, projected in one of the movies uh, indian movie that was shot in 1965 in gumnam where they have shown a scene of an old relic where you have got the haunted house a scene where uh, 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 which is completely full of forested and this is the same site in which we have excavated and that's the datum so indian film is also heritage and that has been also uh, shot at the site and present day movies are also being shot at the site so you can compare the two when you show the earlier site they're showing this as a place as a haunted place in ruins and now they're showing this place as a which has been conserved so indian films are also projecting a documentation which is indian heritage indian culture so we are combining archaeology we are conserving it and we are also saying that whatever is there is also projected through a documentation which could be a indian film which could be a video uh, film which i will show a little later and which has been conserved by the people and the laborer who are working are skilled workers so whenever a site is constructed when this was new the site was constructed the architects were european but the laborers that were used to construct even at that period of time in 16th 17th century the indian skills so any remains that which could which we say that it belongs to a certain culture where when it is constructed or uh, in india is an indian heritage i am trying to highlight that anything that is within the geographical region of india which is conserved which is preserved is done by a labor which is done by skills of indian res uh, force indian resource so we whatever we have in indian subcontinent is indian heritage that it be tangible or intangible so this is what we call uh, in situ conservation which you can see if you go to the, if you go to the site you can see and feel that when you go into a place you can see especially in the evening when the sun is setting 
a completely ruined area. The only close representation what I could see was in Rome, where you, the forum, when you walk through, you feel that you're walking through an ancient street. Here, when you walk through, you feel, uh, feel as if you're walking through a ruined area, which has been conserved. So now when we were excavating, we came across small fragments of tiles, which must have come out from the walls. So this was nothing but very small, small fragments. We thought the best way to do it is to reassemble them. And the work that what uh, the uh, workforce that what we're having, especially the ladies, we made them work along with us so that we could reassemble this small, small fragment of tiles, which we call, which are known as azulages. Azulages basically means a tile. And this is a Moorish, that is a North African influence, which was there in this tile work, which is found in India. What we did was in Goa, we re reproduced them through uh, a jigsaw puzzle and refix them back on the walls. So here you can see the refixing of the azulages, which are very unique, which are very uh, uh, pictorial, which are very uh, having a, a geographical, geometrical designs to be represented back on the wall so that you have a feel when you come to the temple or the church, even that uh, temple can, uh, even the church can be called a temple because any religious place can be called place of worship is a temple. Uh, same thing now we have preserved this tile and we have conserved it. So we have, archaeology site has been conserved and now there is a discussion among our own team whether we should have a new building at the site or we should conserve the site in situ and make the site a museum itself. And the gentleman who's in the middle is a person who had earlier carried out his excavation 1988-89 and the present team uh, is debating what has to be done at the site. So basically it's everything that is a teamwork. And after we have excavated the site and conserved the site, we had also started uh, a small crash at the site because when we're excavating, we have got laborers, we have got workers. And whenever there's a worker working at the site, they always, you must have seen at the building, the children are there. So what we thought was the best way to uh, 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 utilize this young uh, uh, force or, or the children there at the site is opening a crash. So when we, could, when we opened a crash at the site, we saw to it that the, the, these people were provided with nutrition and the mothers and the parents were very happy that, that their wards were cared for and we got more productivity from them when they were carrying out the excavation at the site. And we could, in contrast, when we could get, uh, we usually have school children coming to the site and when we're communicating to school children about the work what we have done, we saw a clear contrast. Here we have got the children what we have in our crash who were equally good uh, intellectually and so also the people from this school, from this uh, uh, convent school who were got the site. So the, the school children were very happy. The school teacher was very happy. They said, okay, the school children, what you have at your place, which you're having a crash, some of them can also take admission in our school and we will not charge them money. And this was a very good uh, gesture on the part of the school that they could adopt our children who were working at the site and they could also be given education, the formal education. And whatever we work we do in Old Goa, whenever we excavate, we take it to the community. We take it to the local community. And we want the people to know that the heritage what we are preserving belongs to them, belongs to us. It is not only the government who is doing conservation, preservation, but if the community is on board, they can transmit the work what we have done and they can safeguard it against any encroachment or any vandalism taking place at the site. We found the approach that what the government generally adopts. Because I am also a government servant who has worked. Generally, we have got this touch me not philosophy. We don't want anybody to come to the site and we don't want anybody to be involved other than us. But we found that when we open the site to the people and we make them responsible, especially the locals who are around the site, they take very uh, great pride in talking about the excavation, what we have done. They, they become the local guides. So this experimentation, what we have done, and I'm sure what elsewhere, even uh, Vivekananda Institute is also doing, we found that this is a very good method of, of conserving the site, other than having our watch and word, who are very few in number. And the locals, when they are brought to the site, they take care of the site and they interpret the site for us. And the people who come tourists, they like to hear the stories by the locals. And then what we do, what we have done at the site is that we have made the site uh, as an adaptive use. So what the church was basically, 
where the activities could not take place because of it becoming intruence, we recreated that. We had a choir group. We exposed whatever inside, whatever the remains, what we got in the excavations, we exposed them every uh, on, on some uh, occasion, like the World Heritage Day on the World Heritage Week. The people are invited. So to identify or to reuse the site, because whatever happened, many a times you see the monument, they are not used. They are not, they are just static. So to just to make them dynamic, we recreated with the happenings what used to happen earlier. And we invite the local peoples to come and participate. And this is what we had done, one of the programs in 2016, where we had reactivated the activities that, that took place there. And this is what we call the adaptive use of the monument. And this is how it could be better preserved. And uh, in conclusion, I would say that we acknowledge our institution, mother institution, the Archaeological Survey of India, all our team members who had participated, and all the people of Goa who supported us to search, to conserve, to preserve, and search for the relics of the Queen, which we could find after a great deal of research. And then this uh, relic, which went back to Georgia for six months, could get a lot of prestige to our country. And we were honored. And our prime minister also would be invited in near future. And what is the spin-off of this, of this uh, discovery is that the Indians who reside in Georgia, they are highly respected and looked up upon. Before, there was feeling of discrimination the among the students and the business people. But later, when we went there and we demonstrated what we have done for them, and the prestige of India was raised, and the student community were very happy that they also could contribute something for the country in which they are gathering their education. And I salute to all the people, especially in Georgia, and our uh, advisors who had uh, interacted with us and through which we could conserve the heritage of uh, Goa, which also had remains from the Georgia and which has still, I should say, has the remains of the cultural remains from the Mauryan period to the present and the subsequent excavation that could be taken up, we could get the remains of the uh, Yadavas, we could get the remains of the Vijayanagaras, we could get the remains of the Bahmanis, like what we have done there. And everything is evident in old Goa. And luckily, the old Goa has been identified as a world heritage site. And all the site has been completely preserved. And the only thing that's awaiting is further excavation to identify the cultural mu of old Goa, which has got a strains from the modern period to the present. And I'm very sure in near future, we could identify the different remains of different cultural elements, the different strata that is, that is get Gold Goa, which could be exhibited at the site itself. And the old Goa or the Goa could be identified with the mainstream of Indian culture and say this is part of India, which had different cultural representations. And I would uh, now welcome any questions that could be asked. And I think um, I could, yes. the organizers could take over from here and yes, yes, yes. ask any questions. Uh, thank you, sir, for the very uh, enriching session. Uh, we have uh, another uh, hour left. You audience can unmute themselves. And also you can post your questions in the chat box. Already there is a question. I'll read it to you, sir. Yeah. It is from Vani Shri. Thank you for the interesting talk. You have mentioned the name of Ushnish Gibran intrigued about an eight year old's mention. Can you share any info about this? Yeah, I, I think, uh, the, I don't know why this question has come, but it's very interesting. Actually, this young boy, Ushnesh, he used to listen to my lectures and talks. And when I was making a presentation, he came and told me, I've been listening to your talk very carefully. You have spoken about what your colleagues have done. You have spoken about what others have done. But what is your contribution? 
but that boy could not understand what i had done was that i had taken the work of my previous people who had made their uh, they had presented their work and i reanalyzed them because i am not the person who has done the early excavation i only reinterpreted what others have done and what others could not conclude i have taken to the level of conclusion by getting into a scientific analysis of the data what was found at the site so ushnish was, was was very critical he said you have not done anything original you have just copied from the earlier and you have just given your view so a 8 year old would only understand that much so we went to the next level of uh, getting a dna analysis but in our talk we want to include anybody who would give their views because our work has been criticized by a by many other scholars that they say that this is not an authentic work because uh, you have not really uh, got 100% dna analysis because actually if you go to genetic science a genetics will be explaining better we need only 1% evidence of genetic uh, 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 strain matching whereas here we could get 10% genetic strain matching so there are different views to it so we are waiting more uh, evidence to come up and we could take uh, take to a different level and get more concrete evidence on this uh, queen keta one story okay there is uh, one more question um, can you please uh, tell again the reason behind the queen's death actually i wanting to was wanting to show you a documentary but i went through the talk myself i have made a documentary on this if you want i can also show the documentary for some uh, uh five minutes if we have got time should we see the documentary now those who know of goa as just a tourist paradise may be pleased to revise this opinion a little amid goa's famed natural beauty of the beaches and the hills lie secrets concealed among churches and ruins that dot the countryside and the erstwhile capital of goa siddharth the goa one of asia's most prosperous cities during the 16th century and today the complex of churches as protected world heritage site contributes to the aura of mystery that surrounds goa It is early morning and the gigantic bell of the church of Mary Immaculate Conception Panjim is announcing the angelus hour. This forward. bell the second large church the church of Our Lady from where I stand if I were to crane my neck and look beyond patron saint of Georgia which were housed in the St Augustinian complex at old figure in the history of Goa conceal another secret the sacred relics of queen ketevan patron saint of georgia who is this queen ketevan queen ketevan is a romantic mysterious figure in the history of goa there has been a controversy about this queen uh, who's from originally from georgia recently uh, she was much in the news because uh, her relics which were housed in the saint augustinian complex at old goa are uh, in the process of once again being unearthed by the archaeological survey of india goa chapter mini circle under the deputy superintendent archaeologist tatahir and his team indeed romantic and mysterious are adjectives that can be used to describe this queen and later saint of the catholic church The story goes that Queen Ketevan, great granddaughter of King Constantine of Kartli, ruled over Georgia in Eastern Europe. In 1630, the Emperor of Persia, Shah Abbas I of the Safavid dynasty, conquered her lands and threatened to destroy Georgia. But the queen to protect her subjects from annihilation surrendered and was taken prisoner in 1614 she remained a prisoner of the shah until 1624 during which attempts were made to convert the queen to islam and force her to join his harem 
both bribes as well as torture were used to persuade her to relinquish her Christian faith. Queen Ketevan, however, withstood all the attempts and was finally killed on September 22nd, 1624. Okay, we have uh, some more questions. How do archaeologists determine the age of any findings such as pottery, etc.? Uh, now, as an archaeologist, generally what we talk of is carbon-14. Whenever there's a carbon-14, there's any organic component that is there that can be dated because of the half-life of the radioactive carbon. But even potteries can be dated if they have got certain residue on them, which could be of organic material. But other material, uh, other dating method is called the thermal luminescence method of dating. It's called TL dating, which can be dated. OSL method is there. So basically, uh, we are using the carbon-14 method of dating, uh, which can be dated up till 50,000 years old. And this can be only done on the uh, organic samples and not on all samples. And the best dating method that archaeologists do is a comparative dating because of the strata that what we get at the site. The lowest is the oldest, and subsequently we have got the later data. And especially, suppose if we have a coin, which is datable, and through which we can date the data. And now the, the most significant thing of our work here is the genetic. Now, genetics are also applied to date the, and have a cross-reference to the work. And the laboratory that is there in Hyderabad, it's called the Center for Cellular Molecular Biology. They are taking up the genetic work. And recently, Birbal, uh, Birbal Sahani, uh, uh, I think, of period botany, even they are taking up this genetic work. So we have got different methods of dating. We have got uh, the radiocarbon dating, we've got thermal luminescence dating, and potassium argon dating is there, through which we can date our archaeological artifacts. And basically, it is based on comparison, which can talk of the er earlier with the later. Uh, and uh, there's a question from uh, Dr. Sitaram. Uh, a fascinating presentation made uh, all the more interesting by the personal first-hand account. It was almost like I was there. Thanks. Uh, this work involves a lot of uh, interdepartmental coordination. How did you manage that? What was the experience like? Sir, I would like to tell you that it was very difficult. That is why it took us 10 years. Because being a government servant, uh, going to Georgia or going to Portugal, was not all that easy. So many times we had to wait for the ne next season to get a fellowship, to go there and to make a presentation and to interact. But luckily, because of the internet, we could communicate. And the Georgian team came to India six times. And they came to India three times during my tenure. Or, and the best thing what we could say is that the Georgian themselves were very much interested to uh, 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 get the remains identified. But, but they were spiritual people. As soon as they got the news that we have identified the long bone at the site, they were very happy. They said, no, no, that is enough. You just mention it because here it is emotion versus science. We as an archaeologist wanted to uh, trace its provenance as authentically as possible. But they being spiritual people, they just wanted the long bone and historically, it was matched with the uh, historical records. And they just wanted us to accept it. But me, as a government servant, it was not easy to, to go to travel at different places. Even I worked in the laboratory. Because generally, what happens, we send our specimens to the lab. If you ask any archaeologist, he says, oh, the dating is going on in the lab. I've sent the specimen. But during my tenure working in France, we were told, that a person, archaeologist, doesn't part with his specimen. He has to work with the specimen. So in West, it is interdisciplinary. In India, it is still, we are following a traditional method, conventional method. Archaeology is my subject. Conservation is your subject. Genetic analysis is the uh, subject of the laboratory. No, a person can be dedicated who can be made to work in all these places because he will be building his capacity. And subsequently, when he's working independently, he can work in all these spheres and get the work done. So it was not easy. 
though when we write our articles then we, when we make a presentation it sounds as if it has happened in a half an hour as if it has happened in one year no it has taken us 10 years to conclusively prove that this remains belong to queen ketapan of georgia and even archaeologically my colleagues have worked from 1988 onwards so i can only take the credit for the last 10 years but i got the foundation from my predecessors ustish also keeps saying that what have you done it is the previous people who have worked i agree it is the previous people who have found given us a clue but they could not decipher it so we have taken to the final level so it is a collective work of five different teams working and getting the results which could trace the provenance to georgia it was not easy sir and also there is one more uh, question uh, from uh, sitaram dr sitaram uh, involving the community that you mentioned is extremely important can you share some details about how this was done is there a formal structure for such initiatives at the asi so generally what happened asi is a very big organization and many times it is individual based because the government has a scheme which is called public awareness so it is for the individual sitting in the chair how you take forward this public awareness so we thought a, uh, this excavation is a very good media where we could take up the public awareness we started off by having this crash at the sites we also got one of the worker who was a laborer who was educated who could act as a teacher you see all this is connected the children were there the school teacher was there and and whenever we have any uh, uh, like the uh, world heritage day or world heritage week we have exhibition so we make the local people come and handle this artifacts because generally we said don't touch no we said you touch you feel so we made the local themselves responsible and we could convert this area as an open air museum and and preserve the site for the people to see to feel have the feeling of that ruin so the local community was always encouraged to come interact and then we also made a diorama in the museum we have converted a gallery completely representing the queen ketaman's episode so the local people were involved at various level so generally it depends upon the chair how he interprets the government's rules and regulation and he could within the lines have the local people participating participating and getting the local community to respect understand and propagate their, their own heritage because we are there only for 3 years 4 years it's the local people who could continue being there and acting as a local guide to the site to interpret the site which belongs to them So there is also one more uh, question from Ekta Gupta. Uh, I have a query regarding the oldest fortification by the Portuguese, as depicted in the old maps. Has anyone studied the remains of that? There are many works which has been done on uh, fortifications and, and forts. There are around fifty-two forts in Goa, but let us not talk of only one period, the Portuguese period. Even the bahmanis had their uh, fort even uh, just outside uh, the uh, the area the the marathas were there in savatwadi even they had their forts so let us not limit ourselves only to one period though i have made a presentation of one period because i worked in that period then i make a presentation of my own work but there are there are fortifications of different rulers that were there the marathas had their fort the portuguese had their fort the adil shahis had their fort so the earliest fort remains could be in chandur which could be a small fortress so we have got lot of forts which are there and the most prominent among them is kabdi rama or uh, even at agwada even you must have seen that movie uh, that um, uh, what is that uh, dil chahta hai the last shot it is there it is shot in the shapura fort so we have got lot of fort perikol fort is there on the bordering between goa and maharashtra so we have a lot of forts in uh, goa which present to different period uh, and also there is one more question uh, why the bones were sent to goa yeah now what happened maybe i was not very clear when i was communicating uh, 
the queen Ketavan was put to death in 1624. So in 1623, uh, two friars or brothers of this Augustinian order, who were the uh, ambassadors of King of Portugal to Iran to Persia. So when they came in contact with this queen in from 1623 onwards, so they became her confessor. And when this queen was put to death in 1624, 22nd September. Her bones were exhumed by one of the father, uh, Angios, and he kept it in his monastery, which was later shifted to Asfahan. And later, the bone remains were sent back to Georgia and presented to her son. And some remains of the bones were sent to Rome, to Vatican. And an arm portion was brought to Goa because there was an Augustine order in Goa. So arm or hand portion was brought to Goa and was kept, as the reference say, on the second window on the epistle side in the chapter chapel. So in Christians, the bones or the relics, as they are called, of the, of the queen, who later became the saint, are kept in different church for veneration. So the bone of a hand of the queen in 1627 was brought from Asfahan to Goa and kept in this Augustan complex. Thank you, sir. There is one more question from uh, Ramana uh, Bharti. Do you find any Stone Age site from Goa? Yeah, uh, I did not mention about that because this was not a part of the Stone Age representation. We have got uh, uh, Middle Paleolithic, we have got Microliths, and there's evidence of Upper Paleolithic also uh, evident in that area. And Dr. Nambirajan of ASI has written a book on the stone tools of Goa through his exploration, what he has done. So we have got remains of the, though we have not found Paleolithic as such, maybe some, maybe some evidence are there, but microliths, middle Paleolithic, and upper Paleolithic stage are there in Goa. And when I was working in southern uh, uh, Karnataka, there we have found remains near Kumta and uh, that Gokarn which is just bought in Goa. Okay. Uh, I think uh, we have almost answered all the questions uh, in the chat box. Are there any further, any other questions? No, when we are making, uh, when we are doing our excavation, you can imagine its significance to the Georgians, but not only the Georgians, even the Portuguese and the Germans. I don't know what uh, this German uh, TV channel ZDF, they also came to Goa and they made a documentary because they had a big budget. The documentary what we made was very, uh, I say, uh, very crude or rustic. But the documentary what was made by the Germans were of really very high HD, uh, uh, HD I think, so filming they have made. And I can show you a small clip if you want about the clarity of their, well, it's a three minute film. I think I'll just show you that, how they have identified the site, how they have documented this small film. Ist er doch nicht einem Phantom nachgejagt? Stammen sie von der Märtyrerin, deren Überreste Mönche in Persien raubten? Ein DNA-Test ist die letzte Hürde. Damit wollen die Forscher herausfinden, ob die freigelegten Knochen genetisch übereinstimmen mit einer Reliquie Ketewans, die in Georgien liegt. Ist für den Wissenschaftler der archäologische Befund nicht wichtiger als der Glaube? Also Knochen gleich Knochen? Wenn sich herausstellt, dass die DNA-Analyse alle Hinweise auf Queen Ketewan gibt, sind Sie dann doch ein bisschen froher darüber, als wenn es ein normaler Knochen ist, den Sie hier gefunden haben, auch als Wissenschaftler? Ich versuche wissenschaftlich so objektiv wie möglich zu sein. Aber sollten wir wirklich den Knochen der Königin gefunden haben, wäre das eine ganz aufregende Sache. Es war eine lange Zeit der archäologischen Suche. Da spielen Emotionen dann doch eine Rolle. Die Forschungen laufen immerhin schon seit 20 Jahren. Das Glück lässt noch auf sich warten. Die Georgier wollen ihr Knochenstück nicht zur Untersuchung freigeben. Es sei zu klein und würde dadurch zerstört. Der georgische Außenminister wird in Neu-Delhi erwartet. 
Die Reliquien sind zu einer Staatsangelegenheit geworden. Symbole des Glaubens. Ein hinduistisches Baumheiligtum am Mandovi River, über 400 Jahre alt. Der Baum stand schon, als Franz Xaver hier missionierte. Die Grab... Symbolisch führen drei Männer des Gläubigen der Streit um heidnische Götzenrichtungen, sondern für das Einlassen auf das jeweils andere in einer Welt. You could see that uh, Philip what they have made. They have dramatized the excavation. It was a very good documentary, very well received in, uh, I should say, in Germany. And uh, films have been made in India, in Portugal, in Germany. And also we have got this earlier time, we had this Surbi uh, episodes. So even they carried out uh, this uh, documentary in one of the episodes. And uh, this is one of the very good finds what we have done and uh, for which I think uh, our Archaeological Survey of India got a lot of credit for the work what we have done. And the most important is conserving. So the site is open to the vagaries of nature. If you don't conserve them, the best thing what we do in archaeology is we bury them again. We excavate and then again we bury them. But if we have got a methodology which we have been at the site, which we call it preventive conservation or institute conservation, the way things have fallen, we have just preserved it like that. And uh, that has to be constantly maintained. And this area should be open to the visitors. But generally what happens when the visitors come to a site, they, visitors tend to be very, uh, uh, I should say, uh, they want information. And they, if you don't provide them signages, information or interpretation, uh, it would not serve the purpose. So we have opened the site for them to come and see. And then we interpret the site in the museum where we have made the diorama. So that's how we could get a good response from the local people. Thank you, sir. Uh, we are almost, uh, uh, we have reached the end of the session. And uh, there is uh, one question. Uh, what is the budgetary provision from the... GOI from Samir uh, Dublé. Yeah, actually, uh, many, many times uh, the press people are always wanting to know how much money has been spent at the site, whether there's a provision or not. Actually, people generally feel that enough money is not spent for conservation. It is not that. Government of India has got funds, and it all depends upon the funds that is required. Initially, you may get some funds. But when you demonstrate your project and the need for additional funds, funds are always provided. It may take time, but funds are always there. Generally, people feel that this is not, ASI has not been able to maintain the monuments because fund is not there. It is not that. Sometimes when you have more funds, we tend to do faulty conservation or faulty restoration. So when you have less funds, better work is done. And when the funds are exhausted, then you can ask for more funds. So it is misnomer among the people that the funds are not there with the government to spend on culture or for preserving its heritage. I'm just making a very generalized statement, but it is true. Thank you, sir. Uh, I think uh, now there is... Uh, uh, Tahir, sir. Tahir, sir. Yes, sir. May uh, uh, I ask you in Hindi? Yes, sir. Ask me. I can talk in Hindi. Yes, sir. कुछ एरकलेज बुद्धिस्ट एरकलेजिकल साइट मिलते हैं को हमें सब देखिए एक एक स्कल्पचर मिला है विच हैज नॉट बीन क्लेरली आइडेंटिफाइड व्हेदर इट बिलोंग्स टू बुद्धिस्ट और वो बट देयर आर सर्टेन रेफरेंसेस एंड देयर आर इंफॉर्मेशन दैट सम रिमेंस ऑफ अ बुद्धिस्ट हैबिटेशन इज लोकेटेड बट उसका ठीक से एक्सक्वेशन नहीं हुआ है उसको हम लोग वेरीफाई नहीं कर पाए हम लोग but there is okay, some okay. difference uh, that uh, that some remains habitation remains of the Buddhist period or Buddhist cultural affinity is there in Goa. But this has to be verified. I will not be able to say for sure. But there is some uh, mention about that. Jains ka kuch milta hai So milta hai. Ese baat nahi. Aur more more samrajya ka kuch. अशोक के साम्राज्य का भाग था गोवा 
हाँ साहब अशोक इन पीरियड में जिस रेफरेंस चांदोर की जो मैं बात कर रहा था ना चांदोर हाँ, में हाँ, हाँ, हुआ है डॉक्टर लोगों ने एक्सकोवेट किया है टू सीजन उनके उसमें रिमेन्स ऑफ द मोरियन पीरियड उसका पोर्ट्री मिलता है we have got evidence of the from morian period onwards in uh, chandur that's part of goa okay thank you sir thank you ha aur sab kabhi bhi kya sochi hum log sochte hai na ki goa ki cheez alag hai goa kuch alag nahi hai goa is very much part of our indian mainstream only super jo adaptation jo culture ka hai in the form of dress in the form of language in the form of uh, built heritage certain remains of the कंटेम्प्रेरी पीरियड ऑफ द पोचिंग स्पिरिट इज एविडेंट बट उसके पहले के भी पीरियड के हमको पूरा एविडेंस मिलते हैं साइट में अगर आप एक्सकवेट करेंगे तो रिमेन्स है अपने पास तो ऐसा कुछ भी नहीं है कि गोवा में और स्पेशली एक फेस्टिवल हर एक घर में ना ये तुलसी वंदना जो होती है बहुत प्रोमिनेंट है गोवा में स्पेशली फोंडा एंड ऑल दिस थिंग टेम्पल्स आर वेरी गुड एंड इवन मॉस्ट साध है बहुत अच्छी जगह है सर हम लोग हम लोग क्या कर रहे हैं उसको मार्केटिंग ठीक से कर नहीं पाए हम लोग मार्केट जो लोग सोचते हैं ना सिर्फ बीच कल्चर So beach ah, culture is destroying the uh, scene of old Goa, uh, of Goa, but even the government there is very sensitive. वो भी क्या करते हैं heritage trail करते हैं, and it is not just the beach culture. At some point of time, maybe some forty years, thirty years back, it was only represented only as a tourist place. But now there is a very good combination. अब तो western ghats है, कितना greenery है वहाँ, अपने पास different cultural strain है ये Goa में. So all of them are being projected now. and uh, who is a very good place and it's very much part of our mainstream india thank you sir ha huh? thank you ha ah, sir okay uh, thank you very much sir for your uh, comprehensive uh, presentation which mainly about uh, uh, perceiving uh, goa not as a beach culture but something much much more uh, beyond and also uh, for making us realize how heritage can Uh, bring people together uh, so people uh, from georgia where they take so much pride in the bone fragments which was found so likewise our country we have in every 10 kilometers we have heritage heritage is there everywhere uh, and also the archaeology which looks uh, so romantic is not actually the uh, romantic or how the how it is shown in the movies but something which requires lot of patience and uh, lot of teamwork and also how as a subject it is interdisciplinary uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, keeping us uh, engaged yeah i would like to add one more thing marvi yes that when we talk of heritage na all of us like for example what is the definition of history everything ever happened is it history for everything that is there in the country is it a heritage the significant aspect which are transmitted from early generation to the present for it to be nurtured to pass through to the next generation that is a heritage all of us are rooted in the past so everything that is belong to us is our heritage and we have to preserve it and we have to be very sensitive and it's not only the government that has to look into the heritage the sapna ghar ka family tradition hai वैसे इट शुड बी कम्युनिटी ट्रेडिशन जो कि अपने पास अभी तक उतना कैच ऑन नहीं किया है एंड वी ऑल हैव अ रोल टू प्ले ऑल ऑफ अस आर द स्टेक होल्डर्स टू स्प्रेड द मैसेज दैट दिस हेरिटेज इज आवर्स वी हैव टू प्रिजर्व इट एंड वी हैव टू कंजर्व इट दैट्स मोस्ट इंपॉर्टेंट एंड देन ट्रांसमिट इट यस एंड एनीवे इट वाज द एग्जांपल्स व्हिच यू हैव uh short uh involving the children involving the communities uh so uh thank you so much uh and uh, thank you everyone for joining us today and once again a very good evening and uh, see you all for the coming webinars and also uh in line to our uh, understanding india webinar series we are also going to uh, start a course Uh, starting from uh, 21st of september which will be certified uh, on india's uh, heritage culture art forms and uh, uh, living traditions uh, hope all of you uh, registered to that uh, looking forward to see you all very soon thank you so much thank you sir thank you thank you